Hey guys, back with another video on Lord Voldemort. There's been a video that has gained quite a bit of attention despite being released by a channel with no previous other videos. I always find that to be weird. Anyway, this was sent to me by one of you guys and it has some juicy claims about vaccinations which I would love to address. Let's have a look, shall we? I want you to think about this. This is a bag of rice. But let's imagine that these rice particles really are the trillions and billions and millions of of viruses and bacteria that is all over the world. Trillions of them like that, right? Okay. Disgusting. Who eats long grain rice? With all of these viruses and bacteria that are spreading, we're breathing all the time. In fact, you probably have this many, all of these, you have this much viruses and bacteria in your own intestinal system right now as we speak. You definitely have a lot more bacteria and viruses in your body. We're talking hundreds of trillions. But yeah, you're just making a visualization so I won't nitpick any further. My thought when watching the video, however, was, wow, what a waste of rice. But then I remembered it was long grain rice and realized it's not really that much of a waste. And we're all in a panic. We're all in a panic because there's a brand new virus we're all worrying about. This one right here, the coronavirus. Can we see that? Can you see that? We're like, oh my God, the coronavirus is going to get us. <laughs> I mean, yeah, if you're infected with SARS-CoV-2, it'll only be a tiny, tiny percentage of your overall microbiome and virome, but that's enough to cause illness. It's not about the actual numbers or the percentage of this virus compared to everything else residing in your body. It's about what this one virus does. SARS-CoV-2 attacks the alveoli cells in your lungs. It's the same with any other disease caused by infection. If you ingest some H. pylori, you'll get an ulcer. If you ingest a harmful strain of E. coli, you'll get food poisoning. Why would this new coronavirus be any different? Now forget about all the billions and trillions of other viruses and bacteria that are out there. Many of them can kill you. Multiple strains of every single one. This is the one we're concerned about this week. And so Chuck Schumer and the World Health Organization are going to just funnel millions and billions of dollars into trying to deal with the coronavirus. There are major differences between the coronavirus and the other bacteria and viruses inside your body. First of all, the vast majority of those ones don't hurt you. In fact, many of them are beneficial, especially the ones living in your gut. They help process certain substances that our own body cannot, they release hormones which regulate our mood, and they take up space to compete with potentially harmful bacteria. The viruses in your body, given they don't really do much good, but they aren't bad either. The majority of them are bacteriophages which infect bacteria, not human cells. But of course, there are always the microorganisms that do want to cause harm, but for those, usually Usually your immune system is pretty good at suppressing or eliminating them. They usually aren't very threatful. That's the first difference. I do agree that there are other threats out there that still deserves attention, not just the coronavirus, but that doesn't undermine all the effort we've put into stopping the spread of this virus. That's the first point. Second, COVID-19 is novel. The virus is new and we've never seen it before. That means it needs research and attention. For things like, say, the common flu, we know about it already. We have vaccines, we have treatment options, we know how it spreads. When the coronavirus first surfaced, we didn't know a single thing. There are no vaccines vaccines, there are no treatments, that's what makes it so dangerous. Which means when it spreads around, people will die and that number will exponentially increase. If something else was spreading around, it can be easily contained because of vaccines, treatments, and general information about that threat. We can't do that with SARS-CoV-2. This is why whenever a new outbreak arises, we need to take action against it. The last thing we want is another Black Death or another Spanish flu. So they're going to work on a vaccine for it, so here's what I'm going to do. Let's just say they come up with a vaccine. I'm going to paint this little, this little piece of rice red, right? This one is now a vaccine preventable illness. Coronavirus is. We'll, we'll hear about all of a sudden. We'll, you'll see CNN, everybody on the news. Everybody on the news will be going, we did it. We've done it. We've come up with a vaccine for the coronavirus. We've changed the world. We're all safe now. And they'll put it into the world. And I'm thinking, what the hell did that just do? There's literally billions and trillions of other things that can kill me because you got one red rice flake and you have a vaccine for one of these. We're all jumping up and down like we're suddenly saved. We don't need vaccines for everything. We only need vaccines for things that can hurt us. That includes the coronavirus, by the way. Now, not everything that infects us could have a vaccine. Certain diseases also have vaccines that aren't as effective. It varies depending on the disease. COVID is something that everyone would love to have a vaccine for because it is actively spreading around the world, and it also has an incredibly easy method of transmission. Unless we have a vaccine, we can't fully feel safe about large gatherings. Now, what about the other threats that could be transmitted between humans? Well, they either have a vaccine, a treatment, or they 
they are non-life-threatening. Let's name a few examples. Strep has a treatment, the flu has a vaccine, the common cold is not very threatening. COVID-19 doesn't fall under any of those conditions, so it's important we develop a treatment and a vaccine as soon as we can. Then there are non-infectious microorganisms. Why should we care about that virus that doesn't even infect human cells? The one grain of rice you marked may be one grain out of, I don't know, a hundred thousand, but that one grain is the threat. If you have one murderer in a city of a hundred thousand people, you want to catch that murderer. Why would you care about the other 99,000? This is moronic. Do you realize that your medical establishment thinks that there will be a day when they will have a vaccine for every single one of these bacteria and viruses? That's their plan. No, it's not their plan, nor is it anyone else's plan. Let's take it a step further, shall we? Let's say that this is an immune suppressed child floating in a sea of bacteria and viruses. This is why we all have got to vaccinate ourselves is to protect this one immune suppressed person, okay? Oh yes, it's called herd immunity. I'm glad you at least know the basic concept of it. Anyway, I'm not going to play the next part of the video because this point is already debunked by the fact that not all viruses and bacteria out there are harmful and therefore we don't need vaccines for all of them. Moving on. But what's really going on? It's a business. All of this is just a business. One thing I never stop hearing from anti-vaxxers is claiming that vaccines are just a business, a way to exploit people in order to make money. And I hate this statement because in reality, it's literally the opposite. Vaccines are not profitable at all. Pharmaceutical companies make their profits primarily through the sale of drugs. In fact, vaccines are so unprofitable that many companies have decided to drop out of producing them. I mean, think about it. When was the last time you paid any significant amount of money for a vaccine? I don't know about you, but every time I got the flu shot, I didn't have to pay a single penny. Compare that to the cost of drugs and you can see where the profits really roll in from. Of course, this sparks another topic on the cost of drugs, but that's not the focus of today's video. The point is, saying that vaccinations are a huge incentive for profit is like saying the purpose of your son's lemonade stand is to pay the rent. Sure, you can make a few bucks out of it, but is it a significant portion of income? But let me show you what's really going on. Let's talk about this immune suppressed person, okay? When we think of measles, here's what we know about measles that back in 1961, when they looked at the stats on measles, you could say that one in 500,000 people died because that's the entire population, or if you were infected, one in 10,000 of those being affected would end up dying. So one in 10,000, otherwise known as a 0.0001% chance of dying if you catch the measles. Imagine all these people represent 10,000 people. 0.001% of them is going to die from the measles if they get it. Why didn't pharma make a product for the 0.0001% of us? You know why. Because this wouldn't make as much money as this. We do have options for that one person. It's called treatment. These are things like antibiotics, antivirals, treatments that support tissue damage or organ failure. These are all things that help people who have been infected and could be in a serious state. So that's already a false claim from you. The thing is, treatment is different from vaccines. Vaccines work to prevent. Treatments only help you get better, but you still have to suffer the symptoms. The best option is to not experience the symptoms in the first place, which is where the power of vaccines come from. We vaccinate as many people as you can, because even if you don't die from it, you can still suffer from it. And then you can transmit the pathogen to other people who may not be qualified to be safely vaccinated themselves. The downside to vaccines is that if you have violent reactions to them or if you're too old or too young, you will not benefit from the vaccine. That's why we can't vaccinate these people. It's not about purposely designing a product for the other 99.9% .9 of people. It's about not being able to vaccinate the 0.1% and the reasoning is that biology works that way. I'm sorry that that's the answer, but it's the truth. Of course, we would try to vaccinate everyone if we could, but the reality is that certain people cannot be vaccinated. These people depend depend on herd immunity to keep them safe. So if you're not vaccinated yourself, you're technically putting others at risk. This is the greatest marketing scheme in the history of mankind. And anyone that believes in this program, that the CDC and the WHO and HHS and everybody else is selling to you, you are seriously lacking brain cells. Oh no, a personal attack. I'll have you know that my mommy told me that I have at least two brain cells. Because this could have been fixed. This 
is putting everybody at risk, lowering our immune systems, injecting all these people with mercury, formaldehyde, aluminum, aborted fetal cell lines, cocker spaniel DNA, you name it, polysorbate 80, over and over and over again. What are we going to do? Are we going to do that with a trillion different vaccines and keep saying, oh, it's just a trace amount of mercury? You're just getting it a trillion times in all of these stupid vaccines. I think I've made my point. I made quite a few videos a while back where I went over the quote harmful substances in the vaccines and explained why they're not harmful. In short, the mercury is not really mercury and many of the things you named are in extremely low doses that you get more by just eating everyday food. That's it for today. Thank you to Fireshard, Liam, Don Jessica, Joel Goldenberg, and JN.